Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar. My name is Augustus Melu, a manager here at Unicom Seminars. We are pleased to be holding a webinar this afternoon titled, Are You Thinking About Process Improvement? The webinar is presented by John Hackett, Managing Director of Franklin Hackett Limited. Uh, the webinar would run for about 45 minutes, and after the session, there will be opportunity for questions as well. John, just to tell you a brief um, bio about John, John Hackett is an organizational change alchemist. He's the founder and managing director of Franklin Hackett Limited. John spent most of his early career working in a variety of roles from business analyst to contact center manager and he gained first-hand experience of the effects of change programs on organizations and individuals. Through this experience, he was able to identify the main reasons for the failure of majority of these interventions. His profound insight is that successful and sustainable change comes from being able to fully understand the procedural and human elements in any given situation, when then employ the most appropriate tools to drive progress. Using this experience, John has changed, created Change Alchemy, a unique approach to change that takes into account both process design and the functioning of people within an organization. At this point, I'd like to hand over to John. There will be opportunities, like I said, um, for questions and answers at the end of um, John's presentation. We hope you enjoy the session and we'll welcome your feedback also. Over to you, John. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for coming along um, to uh, listen to me uh, talk for the next 40 minutes or so. Um, hopefully this is going to be uh, very useful for you. Um, what I'd like to do is to basically um, help you think about what prevents process improvement from being successful and also um, highlight what a continuous improvement culture really means. So um, really the, uh, the purpose of um, today is to answer this question, uh, what are the thinking mistakes that are preventing organizations from embedding process improvement into their culture? So um, as you can tell by the um, word thinking in the title, and there's the word thinking again, this is all about how we think within organizations in relation to process improvement. Well, before we get to that, I um, just want to give a bit, a bit of a background as to the phenomenon of process improvement, because it is something of a phenomenon. Um, it's been fashionable for some years now within organizations, um, to such a degree that there are now a huge variety of methodologies, toolkits, methods, concepts, models, whatever you want to call it, that all revolve around telling you how to do process improvement. It's somewhat confusing out there. And all of this has uh, effectively spawned its own mini industry. So it, it's kind of interesting um, that process improvement has gone from being something which was a niche activity to something that's more or less universally accepted as a useful activity in most organizations. So that we've got the background of something that's become fashionable, something that's become accepted, something that has its own supporting industry, you'd think we would be doing well, but the reality is that over 60% of process improvement initiatives fail. They either fail to complete, they fail to deliver the expected benefits, or they fail to sustain those benefits. So despite all of these elements being in place, we're really not very good at it. Uh, we're, we're not succeeding in really uh, developing proper continuous improvement culture within our organizations um, because over 60% of initiatives fail. Now, one of the things that's interesting is that when you define, you try to define process improvement, it's actually not very easy to find a single definition. And I thought I'd demonstrate this um, to you uh, by actually uh, going on the internet and doing a bit of research and finding um, three definitions of process improvement. 
Here's the first one. Uh, process improvement is a systematic approach to help an organization optimize its underlying processes to achieve more efficient results. So there's your, your nice succinct definition. But then when you dig a little bit deeper, you start finding definitions a little bit like this one. And this one is so wordy uh, that Sir Humphrey Appleby from Yes Minister will be proud of it. Um, I hope you're ready for this. Uh, process improvement is an holistic approach to closing the process or system performance gaps through streamlining and elimination of causes of below specification, quality variation, non-value adding activities. Whew, a lot to take in. And another definition I found, um, again, uh, in, in a, in a uh, process improvement, um, in some process improvement literature, uh, wasn't much better. Process improvement is the fundamental rethinking and radical redesign of business processes to achieve dramatic improvements in critical measures of performance, such as cost, quality, service, and speed. Phew. So there you have three rather wordy and slightly different definitions, and none of them really properly capture what process improvement is. And I'm going to be a little bit naughty, as I'm feeling in a jovial mood, jovial mood and be as bold as to say that these fit into the category I like to call BMS, um, which loosely translated um, means that. And I'll leave it up to you to work out what BS stands for. Um, but joking aside, uh, this is a very real problem, because the, the whole concept of process improvement is not well defined. There is a lot of academic um, and structural sort of language associated with process improvement theory and practice. And this makes it very difficult to get to the bottom of what process improvement is really there to do. So I want to give you a non-BMS definition of process improvement. Okay? And the definition is very simple. All it is is that process improvement is continuously refining the activity of the organization to ensure the customer always gets what they want. And that is really all it is. It's just about continuously improving the way we do things on a day-to-day -day basis to make sure that our customer, whoever that might be, always gets what they want. That's why we're here. All the other definitions skirt around the real issue. And this is the first thinking mistake. It's the tendency for us to focus on the internal output to process improvement from the organization's perspective and not the purpose from the customer's perspective. So when we are doing process improvement, we are aiming to improve the customer's life. Anything else is a fringe benefit. However, you will often find organizations starting process improvement projects for reasons such as improving performance against target, making the organization lean, removing waste steps, streamlining workflows, reducing costs, optimizing IT, identifying efficiencies, et cetera, et cetera. Now, all of these are useful results and fringe benefits of getting it right for the customer, of improving your processes in such a way the customer gets a better experience. But these are not reasons to do process improvement because these have nothing to do with the customer. So this is the first fundamental error that is made in the process improvement world, is going into process improvement projects to achieve these kind of benefits. These are results. They are not ends in of, them, in of themselves. So that's the first thing. Now, we've, we, all, we all talk regularly now in business about continuous improvement culture. And Continuous improvement culture, of course, is uh, inevitably um, uh, the result of process improvement, so it involves process improvement. But again, the reality is it's poorly understood. And most organizations are not capable of uh, achieving a continuous improvement culture. So what I want to do with you now is share the thinking mistakes that cause organizations to fail to embed process improvement and achieve a continuous improvement culture. Now, I could talk for several hours about many different thinking mistakes. But what I thought I'd do, um, given the time we have, is cover four of them with you um, today. Four thinking mistakes which are particularly prevalent at the moment in organizations that stop 
continuous improvement from taking place. So let's crack straight on. The first one is focusing on tools. Okay. Now by tools I mean um, things like um, methodologies, uh, models, uh, plans, that kind of thing. So we're, we're talking about things like Lean, Six Sigma, Kaizen, uh, systems thinking, all that kind of jazz. So a bit of background about tools focus. So we have a tendency to like to buy off-the-shelf solutions in our organization. Okay? It's convenient. Uh, it's convenient. We also believe that tools fix problems universally. So, uh, for example, um, you have the, the, uh, the Lean um, movement, uh, which comes from uh, an adaptation of the work that was done by T. Ono at Toyota uh, many, many years ago. He invented the Toyota production system, and uh, the belief was that the tools he invented for the Toyota production system were universally applicable to all organizations. So the idea being that if you did the same things in a similar organization, you got the same results. Now this is spread across all organizations and into service industries and everything as well. So there are multiple different tools, all that promise that if you implement this within your organization, you will get X results. Um, and the phrase I have on the screen there sums it up beautifully. To a man with a hammer, every problem is a nail. So we believe that these things fix problems universally, but they, they don't. The other thing that makes tools very attractive is they can be taught um, and easily rolled out within an organization. So, uh, for example, you might start a um, lean process review of one part of your business, and once you've done that and the people involved have been through the process, you can then roll it out somewhere else within the organization. Uh, and normally, uh, the expectation is that you get, you get the same results. And tools often do deliver some sort of benefit, at least in the short term. So again, this makes it very attractive to think that tools are the answer to the problem and that tools give you process improvement. However, however, there are a number of problems with doing this. The first thing is that tools are an abstract concept. They are not necessarily related to the problems that you have within your organization, and they are not related directly to the specific of the situation that your organization finds itself in. Okay? And by their very nature, they encourage blind implementation rather than learning and rethinking about the situation that you actually have at hand. This is dangerous. This is very dangerous because it prevents learning based on the situation that the organization is in. So you end up with this situation. Tools are very well understood but the problem or situation is actually poorly understood. It's only understood through the eyes of the tool. So whatever it is that you're using, uh, you know, let's say, for example, that you, you, you're following um, Six Sigma, then you will perceive the situation through the constraints and the structure of the Six Sigma theory. Uh, so it means that you don't get a full understanding of your unique situation. Tools also do not fundamentally change people's mindsets and behaviors. They, they have an influence on them, but normally, again, within the context of the tool. So, for example, I worked with a local authority some years ago where they implemented Lean uh, for the housing repair service. And what that actually did is it changed people's view of the way in which the housing repair service was structured. But they continued to behave and think in much the same way about everything else. And the result was, that over time the service went back to something approaching what it was like before the lean review because they hadn't fundamentally changed the way people thought about the organization. They were still focused on the wrong things. Um, again, another problem with tools is key issues are often missed, so they remain unresolved. So to summarize this particular mindset problem, this thinking problem, um, the tendency to use tools to solve our problems and to drive improvement prevents the reality of the situations that are unique to the organization being fully understood. And then this restricts learning and that it fails to fundamentally change mindsets and behaviors. So tools are a block for real sustainable improvement. Okay? That's the first one. Second one, intolerance of mistakes. This is a biggie. We have a belief, this is both in organizations and in, in society as a whole, we believe that mistakes are inherently bad 
that it's wrong to make mistakes and that mistakes are something that we, we want to avoid at all costs. When we make mistakes, the focus of attention is normally on the perpetrator, i.e. who done it. Uh, so we tend to be focused on the person aspect of the mistake rather than the actual sort of the task or what happened, the circumstances. We, we go straight after the person made the mistake and we, normally we persecute them. That's our standard thing. If you ever made a mistake, you'll, uh, <laughs> you'll probably have experienced some level of persecution for making your mistake. Um, this is also a result of the most common management style in organizations, which is command and control. And we'll come on to that a bit more in a bit. So this again, people focus, not task focus. So this is all about what people are doing and not necessarily about what, how are we achieving the task at hand. And inevitably, um, this results in blame culture. And that, in turn, means that there is generally a, a very big lack of experimentation within organizations. I mean, why would you want to experiment? Because you might make a mistake. And who wants to make a mistake, especially when um, our standard behavior is to persecute mistakes? So the problems from this. The reality is mistakes are normal. They're part of being human. We know this. We all make them. We, to, a, to a degree, they are unavoidable. We, will, we are guaranteed to make some mistakes through the course of every single day. So if they're normal, and they're a normal part of being human, why is it that we view them as abnormal? So to, to view them as abnormal immediately creates a problem because you are never going to get to a position where there are no mistakes. And what's ironic is that when you try something new and different, mistakes become more likely anyway. And of course, the whole of science is based on making mistakes. This is one of the reasons why scientists experiment. They're, they're, you know, and this is one of the reasons why a wrong result is as relevant to, the, to a scientist as an expected result because it gives you information that you can use to make progress going forward. So mistakes are learning opportunities. But in the majority of cases in our organizations, because we have a mistake intolerance, little to no learning actually takes place when we make mistakes. We're too busy persecuting the person who made them. So we don't really learn a huge amount from them, not to the degree we, to the degree we should do. When we have a blame culture, that results in low levels of innovation and initiative. People are not going to take their initiative. They're not going to show innovation because they're fearful of being blamed for any mistakes that might arise. So you get staff that are focused on survival, not improving the business. This is not a good position to be in if we want to embed process improvement and continuous improvement into our culture. We must become tolerant to mistakes. So summary about this level thinking problem. Tendency to view mistakes in a negative light results in a blame culture. This causes staff to focus on personal survival. And then this suppresses their innovation and initiative. So we get stagnation. OK, mistake intolerance. The third one, parent-child leadership style. Wow, what's that? Well, basically, parental leadership is managing people in a parental style. It's treating people as children. Um, it's generally an autocratic. Um, management style, and it's based around um, hierarchies. So this is supported by um, behavior, which we'll call child-like behavior from staff and colleagues. And um, child-like behavior is things like looking upward for guidance, seeking permission to do things, looking for validation to do things. And both of these things work together to create this rather unpleasant behavior pattern of this parent-child leadership dynamic very highly destructive. So what's the background here? Well, this is in fact, when you look, the most common management style. Um, this is, as I said earlier, we, I talked about command and control. This is a manifestation of command and control. And it's supported by the hierarchies that we have in our organization and the individual behaviors, like I said. Um, managers behaving in a parental style to give themselves authority. Uh, colleagues behaving in a childlike sort of style. Um, looking for leadership and validation from the management, and it goes around in a big circle. This means that decision making generally requires management approval, which is a bit like asking your parents to go out and play with your friends in the street in the summer. Uh, it means the staff require validation from management to show initiative. And it places the locus of control with management. 
So this is kind of like a superhero management model where we're expecting the manager to be the all-knowing parent uh, and be the person to guide everything within the organization. Now, this, of course, has problems. The result of this is we get very slow decision making. And we have uh, a management um, dynamic where adherence to rules and structure within the organization is what's promoted. This does not allow for change. This promotes stability. Okay. For the majority of people working within the organization, survival within the system itself becomes more important than actually improving the work. Um, quite frightening, really. Quite technical problem there. Um, there's also a lack of personal responsibility. Uh, because if you have a parent-child leadership model, uh, then by and large, the majority of people will not take responsibility for their piece of work. They will look upwards for the um, approval or the guidance to do that. So you get an abdication of independent thinking. And all the problems and issues are deflected up to management. So this is very, very destructive, and this is in most organizations in some form. And like I said, it's something that is um, promoted by both management and by um, non-management staff. It is a self-fulfilling thing. So this prevailing model, parent-child leadership, creates a culture where personal responsibility and independent thought are suppressed in favor of compliance with and maintain maintenance of the status quo. This is not a situation where we are going to be able to make process improvements or where we're going to have a continuous improvement culture. It is destructive. And this is in most organizations. And finally, the fourth thinking problem, and this is called target focus, and I'm sure we all know all about this one. Uh, I think everybody's had experience of this. So this is the old conventional wisdom that says that we can improve organizations by setting targets. And if you want to see the results of uh, setting targets for improving an organization, have a look at the NHS right now. A uh, fantastic example of what happens when you use targets to try and improve organizations. And targets are actually very, very attractive because they appeal to the command and control leadership mindset. And they also appeal to uh, most people within an organization because people like clarity. And one thing that targets do give you is clarity about what you're expected to achieve. Now that has um, good, good aspects and bad aspects, but people do like that. It's attractive. It's very easy to measure them, very easy to track progress, and it gives the illusion of action and progress. So if we set a target and we improve by 1%, we think we've made an advance. That's kind of nice. That, that sort of boosts our ego within organizations. We think we're doing well. We think we're improving. But are we? Now, the problems with this are, are manifold. First one of which is that there is no reliable method for setting a target. Nobody's ever come up with it, and the reason is there isn't one. There is no reliable way to set targets. And targets are actually based on assumptions, not necessarily knowledge about what's really going on. So, uh, for example, you might ask somebody in a sales organization, um, how did you get to this year's sales target? And they'll say something like, well, we took, we took last year, and we added 5%. And then you might say something like, well, why did you add 5%? Why didn't you add 10% or 5.1% or 4%? And they'll say something like, well, it sounded like a sensible figure. So this isn't necessarily based on the knowledge of what they can achieve. Um, it's based on an assumption. And this is the case for pretty much all targets. If you set targets within an organization, then you set a de facto purpose of meeting the target. So everybody within the organization's focus is meet the targets, rather than let's understand, let's gain knowledge and understanding of how the organization works and what we can do to really improve and deliver a better service for the customer. It just becomes meet the target. By nature, uh, these things back up parent, child, management styles and blame culture. You didn't hit the target, why not? You got it wrong. You're, you're responsible, that kind of thing. And worst of all, the main reason why this is a very destructive thinking problem in the context of process improvement is that targets are limited. They set a limit to what to the improvement is possible. You are assuming that a particular level of performance is possible. 
and like I said, often on the basis of very little knowledge. So this means that it caps improvement within the organization. Okay? Not what we want to be doing if we're looking for real continuous improvement. So, to summarize this last destructive thinking problem. So, target focus, a short-term mindset that arbitrarily caps improvement potential and creates a culture where the focus is on meeting the target rather than understanding and improving the work. So, target focus. So, okay, we've, we've now heard of four thinking mistakes. Tools focus, the idea that uh, if we implement tools, we can get process improvement. Mistake intolerance, um, the fact that we view mistakes as bad and harmful and we don't learn from them and therefore we suppress innovation. Parent-child management, um, the rather destructive behavior whereby uh, initiative and responsibility is passed up to management, usually resulting in no initiative, initiative or responsibility being shown. And target focus, uh, the obsession with setting arbitrary targets to uh, govern the level of performance improvements we're going to get. So four very destructive thinking mistakes. And um, I'd like to suggest that um, within your own organization, you perhaps keep an eye open for the evidence of these things occurring, because um, I think it is very likely that the majority of organizations exhibit probably all of these thinking mistakes. So. These focus organizations on themselves, inwardly, not onto the customer. Okay? This is what's putting the brakes on process improvement. All of this combined. In an organization where all these things are going on, you are not going to improve. So, stuff to watch out for there. So let's move on now, and let's talk about the see, hear, and feel of a real improvement culture. So if these kind of things are mistakes, what's a better way of doing things? What would we expect to see in an organization that had a genuine improvement culture? Well, firstly, what is going to be the focus of that organization? So let's picture in our minds an organization that is genuinely committed to continuous improvement. What is their focus? It's their purpose, delivering what the customer needs. Okay which I have to tell you is really the, process, the, the purpose for all organizations. So all conversations in an organization that is genuinely devoted to delivering the customer's needs revolve around the achievement of that purpose. Now, it's quite interesting because you often hear organizations say things like, uh, the customer is at the heart of everything we do. And it sounds very noble and bold and very plausible, but when you look a little bit deeper, it becomes apparent that actually that's not true at all. Most organizations are focused inwardly. They're focused on things um, such as the uh, factors I pointed out earlier, uh, reducing cost, uh, increasing profit, realizing efficiencies, that kind of stuff. This is all internal stuff to the organization. And as I said earlier, these are ancillary uh, benefits that come from delivering on your purpose, which is providing the customer with what they need. So this is the focus of an organization that is committed to continuous improvement, the customer. What are the behaviors within that organization? What would we expect to see? What I've done is I've tried to put this into three specific categories, and I call them the three A's. They all begin with A. Uh, the first one is antennae. Action is the second one, and the last one is analysis. Three things you would expect to see happening in each individual person within that organization on a daily basis. So let's get into these in a bit more detail. So we'll start with antennae. What do I mean by antennae? Um, what I mean is what we think about. What is it that people within this organization think about and focus on on a day-to-day -day basis? What are they aware of? Well, what we want is them to have a higher level of awareness about the what 
how and why of performance. What are we doing? How are we doing it? And why are we doing it? So bear in mind as I say this, I'm, I'm talking about everybody within the organization. Everybody has an intimate understanding of what the customer needs and how to deliver it in a life-enhancing manner. When I say life-enhancing manner, I mean uh, delivering what the customer wants in a way that actually makes them feel better. This is real customer service, enhancing people's lives. That's what all of us do in our organizations every day. We are delivering things that help customers to live their life. So in an organization where continuous improvement is at the heart of the culture, everybody would have an intimate understanding of what that is. They would also have a continuous interest in how to increase their own understanding and how to improve things. And as I said, this is common to everybody within the organization. So Antennae is having the awareness of what's going on, why is it happening, and how can we improve it? And how does that relate to delivering what the customer needs in a life-enhancing manner? So that's Antennae. The second thing is action. What do we do about things? So our antennae are focused on all these useful things. How do we improve? But what do we do about things when we find something out? Well, first of all, we have in the organization, people are able to act on things. So you remember I spoke earlier about the paralysis that comes from things like parent-child leadership and fear of mistakes. In an organization focused on continuous improvement, people would be able to act which means they will be able to experiment with new ideas in a structured manner. Now, I say structured manner because naturally you can't let people go around and, <laughs> and do whatever they want on a day-to-day -day basis uh, without some level of control. Um, it's sensible to, um, from the customer's perspective, to control uh, what's going on to some degree. Um, but what I'm talking about here really is structured experimentation. So any, any sort of member of staff um, might become aware through their antennae of a particular way in which something could be improved and then the uh, process would be to set up um, a structured experiment to try out different ways of improving that. The other thing is that um, people continuously critically review the work and also this is not personal. Uh, one of the problems within organizations is again going back to the blame culture is um, when people identify problems with processes or areas for improvement, um, it can descend into the personal. Um, people can take it very personally that um, it's an indictment of their poor workmanship um, or, or whatever. Um, really it isn't. Um, it's just a case of understanding that that is what the situation is and looking at how it can be improved. So in this mythical continuous improvement culture, people would be able to critically review the work without becoming personal. The other thing is mistakes would be normalized. So um, mistakes would be considered to be a learning opportunity and not a source of punishment, which would enable people to innovate. And again, this would be common to all staff within the organization. So anybody within the organization will be able to come forward with ideas on how to take action about things that they picked up through their antennae. Okay, so then the last behavior is analysis, which is what we reflect on. Now, in most organizations, um, again, something you can observe, observe in uh, meetings or similar, most organizations reflect on things like the political element, what people did, what went wrong, who's to blame, um, who, have we met the target, what target should we set, all this kind of stuff that's got nothing to do really with improving the organization from the customer's point of view. So what would we reflect on in a continuous improvement organization? We reflect on things like this. How can we improve further? What is the effect of the change that we're making? What do we need to be better at? And it's really as simple as that. So the specific areas where people would reflect in an organization of this type would be on improvement change, how do, we do, how do we get better? And again, everybody would reflect. So there's the three key behaviors, antennae, action, and analysis. Three useful things 
that you would see happening in an organization that was committed to continuous improvement. This is a progressive organization. So we're coming towards the end now. Um, and I thought it would be useful to uh, define what a continuous improvement culture actually is. And this is what I came up with. A highly aware, proactive, and reflective culture centered around improving how the needs of the customer are met. So to sum this up then, we've seen four thinking mistakes that we commonly make within organizations that prevent us from achieving continuous improvement culture. Tools focus, intolerance of mistakes, parent-child management style, and focus on targets. All those things are driven by internal organizational politics and preoccupations. The result of all that is stagnation. In a continuous improvement culture, we would have three behaviors. And tonight, I awareness of opportunities to improve what's going on, how to make things better for the customer, action, the ability to innovate and experiment to improve, and analysis, reflection on what did we do, how can we do better, what ways have we got of improving. This is driven by the external needs of the customer, and in this situation we get innovation, not stagnation. So. I just want to leave you now, before the Q&A, with this thought. Um, back to the beginning again, what is process improvement? As I said, process improvement is continuously refining the activity of the organization to ensure the customer always gets what they want. All about the customer, not the benefit to the organization. Okay. And the perverse thing is, that when we focus on the benefits to the customer, the organization benefits too. So, lots to take in there. I just want to say thank you very much for uh, listening to me. Um, I hope this has given you some food for thought to chew over. And I think now we need to go to the Q&A. So let me see. OK, so we have um, a few questions in. Um, I'll just take them one at a time. So, the first one is, um, someone has asked, you've talked a lot about management involvement in the problems you described. What can an everyday member of staff do about these things? Is it all about the management's mindset? OK. OK, so the first thing to point out there then is that management mindset has a massive influence on the ability of an organization to improve. Um, it's often said that it starts at the top, and it really does. Uh, you know, it, the way in which you manage people has a big influence over the way in which they behave. However, having said that, as individuals within organizations, we do have some control over how we behave and also how we respond to the management style that we're under. And one of the things I can suggest um, that is useful to reflect on is to think about what behaviors uh, can you um, personally take on that would help to promote um, an impro a progressive improvement culture. What is it that you're doing personally that contributes to some of these problems? And that is something that we is within your control. Uh, and what's interesting is that when you change the way um, you behave within an organization, you often have a um, sort of 360 degree influence. So you influence people all around you at any level. And Unless you're in management yourself, that's really the best thing that you can do. Um, if you are a manager, then again, it's useful to reflect back on uh, the same thing and think about what is it that you're influencing in others through your management style. So yes, um, it is. Uh, management has a lot um, to do with some of these problems, but we can all play a part in behaving differently and promoting, provoking a change. Okay, so the second one. Um, somebody's asked me, could you clarify why the outputs we normally get from process improvement projects should not be the purpose of the improvement activity? So why the outputs we normally get from process improvement projects should not be the purpose of the improvement activity? OK. Um, I touched on this earlier. Uh, basically, uh, the problem is that if we 
focus on output, we lose sight of the customer. Um, if we focus on the customer, then we um, have no limit to the outputs and benefits that we can actually get from a process improvement activity. Um, so it is a mistake to go into a process improvement project and uh, sort of set targets or look for um, specific outcomes in areas such as efficiency, uh, cost savings, all that kind of jazz. Uh, really the best thing to do is to focus on improving the uh, customer experience because you find that everything drops out of that. So it's a case of focusing on the most appropriate things when you start a process improvement project. Uh, but it's very easy to get confused by the outputs. A lot of people would uh, go down the, uh, the route of trying to um, deliver very specific outputs. But often you, you miss the real improvement opportunity, which is improving the service to the customer. And then I've got one more question um, waiting for me here. Uh, OK, they're saying, if parent-child leadership is a problem, how do we stop our leaders managing us in this way? OK, well. The simple fact of the matter is you can't directly stop people managing you in a parental way. What, again, as I said earlier, what you can do is change the way you respond. It is very difficult to manage somebody in a parental way if um, they are faced with somebody who behaves like an adult and not like a child. So it would be useful to think how many times am I sort of uh, delegating decisions up to management? How many times am I looking for validation for what I'm doing? for permission, for guidance, and perhaps go to uh, your uh, manager with um, a more solutions-based approach, perhaps present uh, solutions to problems to the manager uh, and avoid sort of reinforcing their parental tendencies. So again, you, if it's somebody's default style to be parental as a manager, you can't necessarily stop that. But what you can do is you can change the way you behave so that you don't reinforce that. And so, again, it's a, it's a case of looking into yourself and saying, what can I do? What, what effect am I having on the culture in this organization? How can I behave differently and influence the culture to go to a different direction? So that's probably the best approach for that. Um, I don't have any more questions left in the um, question box now. So I think on that basis, uh, we'll come towards the end of the uh, presentation. But before we go, I um, just want to um, make you aware that there is, in fact, um, a process improvement conference taking place, which is held by Unicom, who are hosting this webinar. And it's really an extension of what we're talking about today. It's all about the future of process improvement within organizations. Uh, it's on the 20th of November, and it's in London, and it's an all-day event. And it's going to be absolutely fantastic. We've got eight superb speakers from a variety of different backgrounds. Um, they're going to be talking about various aspects of the latest trends in process improvement. We've also got some fantastic exhibitors. And naturally, as, as with all these things, there's some, some absolutely superb networking opportunities as well. Um, the content's going to be amazing. We've got three case studies, which you may well be interested in, which are uh, talking about process improvement projects in real organizations, what went well, what didn't go so well, what would they do differently next time, what can be learned from the projects. And again, it's well worth coming and listening to it. There's nothing like real life case studies. So I really recommend uh, you come for that. And also, there's a number of really good presentations taking place as well you know, on topics such as aligning process improvement with strategy, uh, coping with change, combining culture and strategy. Um, so lots and lots of useful content, all of which build on on um, the basis that you've heard today. So I really recommend uh, you take a look at that. The um, web link for the information on the conference is on the bottom of the slide there, uh, www.conferences.unicom.co.uk. If you go onto that um, web page, you will see a button. Uh, for uh, the Process Improvement con Conference. If you click on that, you'll find there is a link that says Register Now, and you can uh, pop on there and get your place booked. Um, and hopefully we'll see you there. Um, I'll be chairing the uh, conference on that day, um, so it'll be fantastic um, on a personal level to meet 
um, as many of you as possible and perhaps get your feedback on some of the ideas that we've talked about today and some of the things that we'll be talking about in the conference. So really recommend that you have a look at that. And then lastly, before I leave you, um, I'm always happy to um, hear from people um, and have a chat with people about some of these issues. Um, as, as you can see by my, uh, my little bit of uh, verbiage under my company name there, I'm a change alchemist, which means I um, have a massive interest in organizational change. And so if you have any issues uh, around organizational change, behavior change, process change, anything like that, please get in touch. Um, I'm very happy to talk through anything with you and, call, and, and hear your, your ideas and concepts as well. Um, the email address is on, on the screen in front of you there. Um, also, if you pop over to uh, my company website, www.franklinhackett.co.uk, um, there are some uh, resources on there which you may find useful in terms of um, overcoming some of the barriers to process improvement. Uh, if you click on a, a link there, which um, I think it's the banner that says, um, have you attended a webinar recently? There are some documents on there that give you an idea of how to overcome some of the main um, problems regarding um, behavior and uh, culture within your organization. So I, I recommend that you, you do that and get those free materials. So I think we're at the end now. Um, I'd like to say thank you very much for listening to me uh, ramble on for uh, 40 minutes. I, I really appreciate your time. I hope I've given you some useful food for thought to take back into your organization. So once again, thank you very much. Hope to see you in November, and I'd like to hand back to Unicom. Thank you very much. That concludes the Q&A session. Thanks, John, for addressing those um, questions. Uh, we would like to thank John for a very interesting presentation. Thank you, everyone, for joining today's webinar. We'll make the recording available afterwards, and we'll send you a link. And we also look forward to your future participation um, at a forthcoming um, event. If there are any more questions, uh, feel free to send those through to us or directly to um, John with regards to the webinar. Um, feel free also to get in touch if you have any further inquiries with regards to the upcoming conference. We'll be more than happy to um, share further information about that. Once again, we'd like to thank you all for your participation today. Bye.